rehiring. <laughs> right, so I think we can start. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Journal Club. I am not Arthur, as you can see. I'm Sarah Nasser. I'm an editorial fellow for the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer. And first of all, I'd like to thank the ESGO and the IGCS for their uh, continuing support in transitioning and maintaining our journal club um, as a digital and virtual format. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes relevant to the Zoom platform. Uh, for today's journal club. So uh, we are recording today's discussion and the recording will be made publicly available. Participants with cameras turned on may appear in the video recording. And we ask everyone please to keep your microphones muted so that everyone can hear the presentations. If you're having any difficulties or questions, please send a message in the chat and we will, our technical team will try to support and assist um, as soon as possible. We will also have plenty of time for Q&As, and we definitely encourage you to submit your questions via the chat, questions and comments um, throughout the session, and we will read those and take those into consideration. So please do that. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to Dr. Pedro Ramirez, Editor-in-Chief of the journal, who will introduce today's article and discussant. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, participating in uh, the Journal Club today. Uh, we're really very, very happy to uh, have uh, Dr. Uh, Kathleen Schmaler, who is the primary author of the CONSERVE trial. We're incredibly proud to have the trial published in the journal. Uh, as many of you know, CONSERVE was a prospective trial of conservative surgery for low-risk early-stage uh, cervical cancer. So we're really looking forward to, to this journal club. We're very excited to have Kathleen. Uh, and uh, we wanna thank all of you for your participation in the, uh, in the journal club. Um, I also want to certainly encourage uh, all of you to submit questions. Uh, we have a, a great opportunity to actually directly ask the, the primary uh, author and principal investigator of the, of the uh, trial. So, we're really very looking forward to a, an, an interactive and, and engaging uh, discussion. So with that, I'll uh, pass it on to uh, Kathleen, who's going to give us the overview of the uh, CONSERVE trial. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to, to be here today uh, to be able to um, discuss the results of our uh, CONSERVE trial. Um, I have a few slides that I'm going to share. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, well, um, as Pedro and others mentioned, um, we just published the results of the CONSERVE trial um, in the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer. Um, and this was really a, a huge effort with many amazing collaborators, both from MD Anderson and all over the world. Um, you can see all the authors listed here. Um, a huge thank you, especially to um, Pedro, Rene, and um, Michael as co-investigators for all their support and collaboration uh, and mentorship um, in this process. Um, and a big thank you to the journal, the fellows, um, and Susan for organizing this, this journal club, and certainly for all the uh, social media. Um, I think that um, I've never been so famous, thanks to, thanks to all of you. Um, so the background uh, for this study um, is that the standard of care for early stage cervical cancer is a radical hysterectomy for women who don't desire future fertility um, and a radical trachelectomy for women who do desire fertility preservation. Um, based on many retrospective studies, uh, including one from our institution, we hypothesize that radical surgery may not be required uh, for women with early stage cervical cancer who have low risk pathologic features. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that. Um, so we designed this single arm um, study of 100 patients um, to evaluate the safety and feasibility of performing conservative surgery uh, in women um, with these low risk features. 
Um, the study um, took almost nine years to complete um, from April 2010 to March uh, 2019. Um, as I said, it was a single arm study. It was a prospective study and a multi-center study um, that included 14 sites in nine countries uh, from all over the world, um, many from Latin America. The inclusion criteria um, were women who had uh, FIGO 2009 stage 1A2 or 1B1 cervical cancer. They needed to have squamous cell uh, histology or adenocarcinoma. And for squamous cell, it was grade one, two, or three, but for adenocarcinoma, grade one or grade two only. So women with a grade three adenocarcinoma, uh, adenosquamous histology, um, small cell or other high-risk histologies were excluded from the study. The tumor size had to be less than or equal to two centimeters. And this could be, this was based on physical exam and or imaging. So if anything showed the tumor to be greater than two centimeters, the women were not eligible. Um, no lymphovascular space invasion, uh, a depth of invasion less than or equal to 10 millimeters. And this was actually added um, partway through the, the study. Um, they needed to have negative imaging for metastatic disease and then negative cone margins, um, both for cancer, but also for high-grade dysplasia. So for CIN2, 3, um, or adenocarcinoma. Um, you can see here on the right is the, and this is taken directly from the, the paper, um, but this shows the, the results um, of, our, of our study. So we had 100 evaluable patients, and um, I'll just note that we had to enroll far more patients than that to reach 100 evaluable patients. Um, the biggest reason for that is that all the pathology was reviewed, centrally reviewed at MD Anderson, so all the slides, um, et cetera. And so we had many cases where uh, the patients were not eligible after histologic review. So of those 100 patients, um, the women actually had the choice for the, the um, type of surgery based on whether or not they desired preservation of fertility. Um, so you can see in the, the first um, uh, column that women who desired uh, fertility underwent uh, cervical colonization. Um, and then if all the criteria were met, they were allowed to go on the conserved study. Um, if they criteria were not met, say they had positive margins, they could actually have a second cone done to meet these eligibility criteria. Um, once they had a cone with negative margins that met all these criteria, they underwent a second surgery to evaluate their lymph nodes, what we call a lymph node assessment. And that assessment um, was either uh, a full lymphadenect pelvic lymphadenectomy, sentinel lymph node biopsy, lymphatic mapping and sentinel lymph node biopsy alone, or sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by a full lymphadenectomy. We allowed all three of those um, based on the standard of care at that institution, um, surgeon preference. And that obviously changed throughout the, the um, eight plus years of the study. Um, if you look at the second column, this was for women, this was the option for women who did not desire future fertility. So they underwent the cone, and then if they, if needed, they could have a second cone. And then if eligible, they underwent a subsequent surgery where they had a simple hysterectomy. So not a radical hysterectomy, but a simple hysterectomy and a lymph node assessment. Again, sentinel lymph nodes, full lymphadenectomy or the combination of the two. Um, and then we had a third group who we also included in the study. And this was women who underwent what we call an inadvertent simple hysterectomy. So these are women who had a hysterectomy prior to going on the study, and it was not known that they had cancer or they, it was thought that it was a stage 1A1 tumor, so a simple hysterectomy would be appropriate. Um, and then in these patients, the post-op diagnosis showed that they had stage 1A2 or 1B1 disease. So if women came to us who'd had this situation where they had a simple hysterectomy, had a post-op diagnosis of, of cervical cancer, so an inadvertent simple hysterectomy, because really mm -hmm. by standard, they should have had a radical, they were also eligible provided their margins were negative and they met all these pathologic criteria. So now to go to the results, you can see here 
um, in both groups one and two, so the women who had a cone followed by lymph node assessment and those who had a cone followed by hysterectomy, we had patients with positive lymph nodes. Um, so two in the first group and three in the second group, zero in the third group. So of the 100 patients, we had five patients with positive lymph nodes, so 5% positive lymph node rate. This was higher than I had anticipated, given how low risk our patients are, um, but was significant. And so one of our conclusions is that we still need to do lymph node assessment in these low risk women. And then if we keep going down, we can look at um, uh, recurrent disease and residual disease. So in the, the first group, the women who had a cone followed by lymph node assessment, we had one patient with recurrent disease. So one of 42. Um, because we take out those two patients who had the positive lymph nodes, we do not follow. We did not follow those patients for recurrence, or we followed them separately. Um, in the group that had cone followed by simple hysterectomy, we actually had one patient who had residual disease in the hysterectomy specimen. Um, and then of the remaining 36, we had no patients with recurrent disease. Um, and then in the inadvertent um, group, we had two patients, so two of 16 or 12.5%, so very high rate of recurrent disease. Um, so just some of the takeaways and the results of the paper, as I said, we had a positive lymph node rate of 5%. Um, the rate of residual disease in the hysterectomy specimen following a chromization was 2.5%. Um, this was a patient with adenocarcinoma. She had adenocarcinoma in situ, had um, the cones, and then was found to have a skip lesion with residual um, tumor in the hysterectomy specimen. And then, you know, one of our main outcomes was the two-year recurrence rate, which was 3.5% overall. Um, but when you break it down by those three groups, it was 2.4% or one out of 42 in the women who had a cone followed by lymph node assessment, zero in the women who had chromization followed by hysterectomy and lymph node assessment, and then 12.5% or two of 16 among women who had an inadvertent simple hysterectomy followed by lymph node assessment. Um, and so here is just a, a summary of some of the things that I just said. Um, if you look on the very, on the right side, um, just a little bit more about the follow-up. So the median follow-up was 36.3 months, range of zero to 68 months. Um, when we look at stage, interestingly, we actually had more patients with stage 1B1 disease. So 67% versus 33% of 1A2. Um, 96 of our 100 patients, so 96% underwent minimally invasive surgery. Um, this study uh, completed its accrual or was completing its last few patients when the LAC results um, were published. Um, so we therefore had no, we made no changes in uh, minimally invasive versus open surgery. Um, again, our study was not powered to answer this question. Um, but we did, uh, we did have 96 or the very large majority of our patients undergo their surgeries uh, in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, when we look at the lymph node assessment, uh, 58 patients had a full pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, uh, 38 um, had a full pelvic lymph node uh, plus sentinel nodes, and then four patients had sentinel lymph node biopsy only. Again, that became more accepted as a standard of care towards the end of the study. Um, as far as pregnancies, um, there were 14 pregnancies reported among the 11 women, or 27.5%, um, who underwent fertility preservation. Um, of these 14 pregnancies, 13 delivered at term, and one resulted in a fetal demise at 22 weeks of gestation. Our conclusions from the, the study are that uh, select patients with early stage, low risk cervical carcinoma um, may be candidates for conservative surgery. Um, but again, um, these patients are a very select group um, and meet the, the criteria that are listed on the left-hand um, side of the slide. Um, there are two other ongoing prospective studies, the SHAPE study, NGOG 278, um, which will be published um, hopefully in the next year uh, or year and a half. Um, and we hope that with, with all these studies, we'll have very, very good prospective evidence um, to consider changing the standard of care 
to conservative surgery, again, assuming that um, SHAPE and GOG 278 have uh, similar results. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to um, start taking any questions. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for, for the presentation. And again, congratulations for completing this uh, really very important study. Again, I mean, I think that this is the, the first prospective uh, evaluation of doing something less than a radical hysterectomy in patients with low risk disease. So we're starting to get questions. And again, uh, I continue to encourage you all to uh, write in your questions. Um, this uh, first question is from, uh, from Italy, from Nicolo Bizarri. Um, and uh, he says, you know, patients are undergoing conization only and conization plus simple hysterectomy had a 2.4% and zero recurrence, while patients who did not undergo conization had 12.5% recurrence rate. So his question is, can we assume that conization reduces your risk of recurrence in these low risk uh, cervical cancer patients? Um, and again, I mean, I think that this also brings up a subsequent point that has been made regarding doing conization as a protective uh, um, effect on recurrence rates. So what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a terrific point. Um, in our, our conclusion and in our discussion, the, the recommendations based on our data from the study are that women who undergo this inadvertent simple hysterectomy where they don't have a cone first to remove the um, tumor should not undergo conservative surgery. Um, a 12.5% uh, recurrence rate, even though it's a very small number of patients, is just not, um, not acceptable to us. And you know, I think further study is needed to know what's the ideal um, treatment for these patients, but based on our results, it's not conservative surgery. Um, for the other groups, yes, we had one recurrence in the cone only group. That recurrence was prior to us um, amending our inclusion criteria. That patient actually had positive margins for high grade cervical dysplasia. Um, and she also had more than 10 millimeters of stromal invasion. Those two inclusion criteria were not part of our initial inclusion criteria back in 2008 um, when we wrote the study. Um, and after the, this was one of our very first patients and when she recurred um, and she was a patient from MD Anderson, we stopped the study, paused the study and changed our inclusion criteria. So although we had one recurrence in that group, once we changed those criteria, we actually had zero. We had no additional ones. And then in our hysteres hysterectomy group, we had zero. So from that, we, we hypothesized that removing that tumor with the cone prior to, to um, uh, doing the next surgery um, seems to be safe um, and effective. So um, our conclusions from the trial are for those two groups of patients that it's safe and feasible uh, to do conservative surgery, but for that group that doesn't have a cone first, it's not. One very important point I wanna make is that all these patients had two or more surgeries. And so I think what's really important is to do that cone first, either a cold knife cone ideally, or if needed, you know, a leap to really make sure that patients meet the criteria before going on to a simple hysterectomy with lymph node assessment or lymph node assessment only. If we try to skip a step for patient convenience, for cost, for our convenience, we're gonna get in trouble. So I, I think it's really important that you need to do the cone, make sure the patient is eligible. If needed, do a second cone, make sure the patient is eligible, then move on to the, um, the next step of surgery. So Kathleen, another question from Fabio Martinelli was, you know, obviously what about the patients that have um, carcinoma in situ uh, at the margins? Can we just consider doing a leap or a laser for those patients rather than a repeat cold knife cone? Yeah, so I think you can do a leap. I would not recommend doing a laser. You need to do something where you have the pathology to review. Um, so um, when in our pre-invasive di disease clinic, so in our colposcopy clinic where we're not seeing patients with cancer, we do a repeat cone um, on those patients 
usually, especially if they don't desire future fertility. So if they have an underlying diagnosis of cancer as well, you absolutely need to make sure you have negative margins for pre-invasive disease. And I would recommend getting those through an excision so that there's good pathologic review prior to going on to, um, the, to managing these patients with conservative surgery. Kathleen, another question, uh, of course, about the uh, approach, MIS versus open. And the question was, on the patients who had recurrence, what approach was taken in those patients, minimally invasive or open? Yeah, so all the patients with recurrent disease had minimally invasive. Um, so the two patients in the inadvertent hysterectomy group had a laparoscopic or robotic hysterectomy, then were diagnosed with the the stage 1A2 or 1B1 cancer, and then had a second surgery with a laparoscopic lymph node dissection. Obviously, they couldn't have sentinel nodes because there was no cervix to inject anymore, so they had full lymphadenectomy. So they both had MIS. Um, but again, most of the patients in our study had MIS surgery, um, but there's a, a concern in those patients at, um, with their recurrence. One thing I will say is that um, neither of them recurred in the parametria. Um, one recurred in an inguinal lymph node um, and one recurred um, with peritoneal disease as well as um, uh, lung metastases. So um, I don't think it's a parametrial issue, which is the, the whole point of conservative surgery is to leave the parametrium, but those patients did have uh, recurrent disease, and therefore that's why we're not recommending this group be included in, in our recommendation for conservative surgery. Yeah, and the other things also that I would highlight again is that this study was not a study looking at open versus MIS, and, and any event that happens in this study is going to happen in the MIS group because overwhelming majority of patients had minimally invasive surgery. So regardless of what your question is, it's going to end up being in the MIS group because that's what, what patients had. Um, uh, this... Can I just say one thing too? And I, I just want to be really clear that the results of our study do not change the LAC trial results. I've gotten a lot of questions about that on social media and by email and phone calls, but the LAC, you know, the LAC trial was designed to answer that question and answered it in a randomized prospective study. Um, so our findings here, again, as Pedro said, this study was not powered for that. It was not even one of our questions when we started. I mean, in fact, it supports the LAC results because all the patients had uh, minimally invasive surgery. Uh, now, and this next question is from uh, Sergey. Uh, uh, Skugarev in, uh, in Russia, um, what was the adjuvant treatment for patients with positive lymph nodes? Great question. So the five patients who had positive lymph nodes went on to receive chemo radiation. Um, all of them are without evidence of disease um, at this point, but they all came off study, received um, chemo radiation, and then were followed per standard of care. So uh, another question, going back to MIS, uh, Navia Nair, uh, she asked, for those who had MIS hysterectomy, were there any criteria on using the uterine manipulator? No, there were no criteria. It was um, based on whatever the standard of care was at, um, at each institution. And we actually didn't even collect data on that. And then again, just uh, reinforcing what Kathleen was saying, this study was being conducted before we knew the results of the LAC trial. So this study was being conducted when we thought minimally invasive surgery was okay for patients with cervical cancer. Um, so another question from uh, Florencia Nol in Argentina. Almost uh, 30 patients were not el eligible after pathology review, primarily due to the presence of lymphovascular space invasion. So do you think that this level of discordance between one center and the other shows the must of having a well-trained pathologist. Yeah, you know, I think having a well-trained pathologist for everything we do in, in oncology is, is really important and crucial, but it's also not realistic, right? Especially um, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in other areas, there just, there just aren't enough pathologists in general. And then certainly those trained um, uh, to specialize in gynecologic cancer, never mind in, in cervical cancer. 
I think, you know, our, our study was very controversial at the time that we opened it. Um, it may not seem that way now because conservative surgery has sort of become more and more common and a, a topic of discussion, but it was very controversial even within our own institution at MD Anderson. Um, we were considered a little bit rogue in, in, in doing this despite great work by Michael and Pedro and others. Um, so I, I think that it's, it is the ideal to have a, a pathologist to very, very carefully look at this. We excluded LVSI um, and grade three adenocarcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma due to the concerns at that time of the higher risk of, of recurrence um, and higher risk of lymph node involvement. Again, there's, there's, there's retrospective uh, data um, on these topics, but not great prospective um, data. Um, the inclusion criteria for shape um, allow for LVSI, so we may be have a better answer regarding that question. This may be safe for women with LVSI. We didn't study that, so I don't know. So that may become a little bit of a moot issue of whether or not a pathologist will pick up LVSI. Um, I think the more carefully you look, the higher the chance you'll find it, the more experienced you are in looking for it as a pathologist. Um, I think the key, key point for us is depth of invasion and margin status. I think margin status is really important, which is a little bit easier uh, to determine than LVSI. So although it's ideal to have this pathologic review, and I think it's a huge strength of our study, it's also not realistic for um, treating women with cervical cancer around the world. Thank you, Kathleen. Another question, this one comes from René Pareja in Colombia. Uh, he says the relapse rate among those patients who had an inadvertent hysterectomy was surprisingly high, um, particularly in those without residual disease. Um, again, clarifying for, for our international audience, that inadvertent hysterectomy is when a patient undergoes a simple hysterectomy in the setting of invasive cancer, and then after the final pathology, you realize that the patient should have had a radical hysterectomy. So um, this rate, he finds it very high. What are your, your thoughts? Yeah, we were also very surprised by this and we actually stopped the study. We paused the study. Um, our study is re was reviewed um, and monitored by a da data safety monitoring committee at MD Anderson. So this is an independent group uh, of people who look at our, not involved in the study who monitor our results. Um, and we were required actually to close the study when we had those two recurrences. Um, we don't know why, um, you know, as I said, both those patients had MIS surgery, they had residual cancer. It was before we had any results from the LAC trial. So we were really baffled by this. But then as the LAC results became available, um, I think it shed a little bit more light into, you know, that these patients are at higher risk. And again, the recurrences were not in the parametria, they were um, distant recurrences. Um, so they're, they're, you know, our, our hypothesis is there's obviously something going on, but as we've all seen on all the, um, uh, the post-LAC discussion, it's, it's still unclear exactly what the reason is. So Kathleen, the next question is regarding imaging. Um, should we use PET-CT? as an exclusion criteria or as an evaluation of these patients in whom you're thinking about conservative surgery? Yeah, so a PET scan is helpful in, in making sure there's no um, metastatic disease. Um, obviously, we wouldn't include anyone uh, for surgery um, and certainly not for conservative surgery if they had metastatic disease. Um, and then I think also we wanna measure tumor size. So in an ideal, ideal world, we would probably have an MRI to really define the tumor in these patients and a PET to make sure there's no uh, metastatic disease. But that is not realistic in most parts of the world, including you know, um, in the US, um, in a lot of places. So I think um, imaging, we allowed for the study imaging with either PET, MRI, or CT scan. We wanted something to make sure there were no, um, no evidence of metastatic um, disease. And then the tumor size, we obviously have physical exam, but if an MRI um, is possible, also ultrasound CT scan um, 
be okay. But I, I think to say that everyone needs an MRI and a PET um, would be ideal, but it's just not realistic in most in most parts of the world. Because think, of the, cost. the next question comes from Payam Kashi at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. It says all the pathology was reviewed at MD Anderson, Central Pathology Review. Obviously, this is not feasible. We can't all send our pathology to MD Anderson to get reviewed. Are there any pathology guidelines for all pathologists um, to follow regarding uh, cervical cancer? Um, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, our, at least our pathologist is not on. I don't know if others are on. I know the WHO um, has very good um, uh, pathology uh, requirements, minimum reporting standards um, that are used for gynecologic cancers, including cervical cancer. Um, but I would defer that question to uh, any pathologists exactly what guidelines they recommend if there is anyone on the call. So this, this question is going back to uh, Sergey. Um, he asked, uh, did you use ultra staging procedures? Do you have any data on your rates of macro versus micro versus isolated tumor cells in your data? No, not for, not for this um, study. Okay. Um, so certainly opportunities to do that uh, beyond that at this point. Uh, Navia goes back to asking, um, how, how could you extrapolate these results to pregnant patients with newly diagnosed cervical cancer? I currently have one and I'm dealing with this dilemma. For those that meet inclusion criteria, would you offer a cone and lymph node alone? Yeah, I think based on our data, we did not have any pregnant women. So I, I think it's hard to, to make um, that leap based on, on our study. Um, however, um, uh, Dr. Salvo and Dr. Ramirez from MD Anderson, and I believe Dr. Pareja have published on, on this topic of doing uh, a cone during, during pregnancy, again, small case series. Um, and it would depend a lot on um, the details um, of the patient and her, the review of her pathology. But um, I believe from their study that, that that may be an option for her. Yeah, and Navi, I'll be happy to share that publication with you. But yes, uh, those were patients who were pregnant who uh, did not wish to undergo radical hysterectomy or radical trachelectomy, and they just underwent cone and lymph node, and the oncologic outcome was, uh, was excellent in, in those cases. Um, so um, I also wanted to get to some of, the, uh, some of the questions from our fellows, and perhaps we can actually, in the interest of time, Ceci, we can just straight, go straight to the questions rather than the polls so that uh, we can get uh, more uh, opportunities to discuss this with Dr. Schmeler. So Cecilia Darín from Argentina will ask the first question. Hi, thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Dr. Schmeler, for this, this great uh, article. Um, well, one of my first questions, actually, I think it has already been discussed. It's about the, these favorable results that we see in the CONSERV trials. Do you think they have to do more with the strict criteria selection and the low risk patients or the fact that they all have a cone with negative margins and no residual tumor? Yeah, so I think it's actually both. I think the, the pathologic criteria were really important. Again, they're very, very conservative. Um, and as I said, the other two prospective studies, the criteria vary slightly. So we'll see when they all come together. Um, I also think that that's really an area of future study is really refining these criteria of what, um, what favorable pathologic uh, features we really need to look at. Um, but again, I think just based, if we look at our, our three internal groups, the group that did not get a cone with removal of the tumor obviously had much, much higher recurrence rates. So I think from what we know so far, we need both together. We need a very, very well-selected group. Um, and then we need to make sure they have a cone with negative margins prior um, to the conservative management. One of my biggest concerns about um, this study and the reason I'm so grateful for all, for the journal club, for the podcast, for all the social media is that we don't, we don't skip steps, that we don't start um, you know, saying, oh, well, she has LVSI, it's probably okay, 
or her margins are positive for CIN3, it's probably okay. Oh, I wanna do it as one procedure. So I'll do a cone and a hist in the same surgery um, without good frozen section. I, I'm just really worried that people will say, oh, conservative surgery is safe and start to cut corners and then we will harm women. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, the next question comes from uh, Emma, who has stayed up late in Australia, Emma Allison. Uh, so Emma, I hope uh, you're still with us. Uh, what is your question? I'm here. Thank you, Pedro. Hi, Kathleen. Um, was just wondering what the justification and evidence was for the depth of invasion cutoff being 10 millimeters. Yeah, so that was based on um, some retrospective studies. Um, there's a big study by Al Covens in, in Toronto um, and Jason Wright when he was at WashU looking at radical hysterectomy specimens um, after the fact. So the women underwent a radical hysterectomy and then they looked back to see how many had parametrial invasion. Um, and based on some of those retrospective studies, the women who had a depth of invasion more than 10 millimeters um, were considered um, at higher risk. We did not um, include that in our retrospective study that um, Dr. Framovitz did at MD Anderson. Um, and the, the literature was a little bit mixed. So we originally did not include that as, uh, as an inclusion criteria. However, when we had that very early recurrence, it was a woman who had a cone um, and she had 13, I believe 13 millimeters of invasion and positive margins and then have a second cone um, where she didn't have any more uh, depth of invasion, uh, invasive cancer, but she did have positive margins for CIN23. And then we took her only for a lymph node assessment. And she at three months actually had a recurrence um, and ended up to go on to get a radical hysterectomy. Um, so after that, we changed, we became, we became very nervous. It was one of our first patients and everyone said, see, this is not safe. You shouldn't be doing this. Um, and so we really looked back and made our criteria even more conservative um, to match everything that was out there. Um, but again, I think further, further work is needed to see, you know, where depth of invasion fits in. And the one patient that we did not take that into consideration did recur. All the patients that came after her had depth of invasion less than 10 millimeters. Kathleen, the next question is uh, regarding um, HPV type. Any data on HPV type in patients who had recurrence? No, um, we did not include HPV testing at either in the initial um, diagnosis or in follow-up of these patients. Um, HPV typing was actually just becoming available even in the U.S. Um, during the study. Um, so we do not um, have those data. We know that 50% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV 16 and another 20% or so by HPV 18. Um, and there's ongoing work to see if, you know, we can um, predict recurrences based on HPV testing, um, but that was not part of the study. Um, we sort of had the old school, we saw everyone every three months with a PAP um, uh, and exam, um, uh, you know, for two years. So Kathleen, this next question is actually uh, quite interesting. You're an expert in uh, cervical cancer, pre-invasive disease. What are your thoughts on vaccination after the cone? So that's a great, great question. Um, so there are a lot of small studies um, in pre-invasive disease that if we give um, a, a vaccine at the time of cone or right after cone, that it'll help prevent um, recurrence um, of SYN2, SYN3. And so we were very excited about this for a while. There's a big study that's just finishing, um, or just finished, I think, in Africa, but I don't believe it's yet published to try and answer this question. Um, and the preliminary results show it's a negative study. Um, so I think a lot of our enthusiasm to, to vaccinate uh, people after LEAP to help prevent recurrence, and then we could do it after um, treatment of invasive cancer. And again, these are the prophylactic vaccines, just the Gardasil and um, Cervix that we have available. But I, I, I don't know. I, I think I was excited about it for a while. Now there's some negative data, but we'll, we'll see as these, um, as these prospective studies mature. What I will also say is there's a lot of work now with 
therapeutic HPV vaccine. So again, this is a completely different thing than our, the Gardasil that we have. These are therapeutic vaccines. And we have an ongoing study um, here at MD Anderson of giving therapeutic vaccines at the time of radiation um, to see if that prevents, uh, prevents recurrence. So I think a lot of exciting work in this area, but um, certainly from our study, we don't have, we don't have that answer. So Kathy, Renee? Uh, uh, I think Renee had a uh, comment about that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Catherine. We reviewed the issue, and there is a randomized trial called Speranza trial from an Italian guy, but it's not really a randomized trial because the patients chose uh, to get vaccinated or, or not getting vaccinated. There is another from Korea, and there is a lot of biases. So the current data on vaccination after colonization is that is useless. There is a, a prospective trial from the same guy who published the Esperanza trial called the HOPE study. The HOPE study pretends to recruit about 1,000 of patients, but the difficulty is the outcome, the, the final events are too low after a colonization with negative margins, less than 5%. So in order to find differences, you have to, to include a, a lot of patients. Uh, personally, I think that a therapeutic, a prophylactic vaccine doesn't have any role in, in after after colonization for for due to nitric, cyanotri. Remember, we should be vaccinating our kids, right? I mean, that needs to be the the big focus is to get the HPV vaccines to the to the kids. All right, so we're going to go to uh, Sarah Nasser. She's going to ask a question regarding the type of uh, hysterectomy. Sarah, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and proceed with your question? Thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Dr. Schmeller. And my question is about nerve sparing surgery, which can reduce postoperative complications um, in radical hysterectomy. So would you consider nerve sparing radical hysterectomy as a treatment option in this group of patients instead of simple hysterectomy? Um, another great, great question. You know, I think because a simple hysterectomy um, was effective in these patients, I don't know that that's needed. My, my concern with um, a nerve sparing hysterectomy is that in most countries of the world where cervical cancer is high, we don't have people who can do a simple, who are trained to do a simple hysterectomy and lymph nodes, never mind a regular radical hysterectomy or a radical trachelectomy or then a nerve sparing hysterectomy. So although I, I think it's, um, it's interesting and, and, and obviously, you know, maybe helpful, I don't know how, um, how much we can disseminate it all over the world, especially to regions with a high burden of cervical cancer. Um, one of the reasons we're really excited about these results is that it shows that in countries where there isn't someone trained to do a radical hysterectomy, which is many countries around the world, as you all know on this call, um, that there's now an option to, to do a simple hysterectomy. And so these surgeries could potentially be done by someone who's not formally trained in gynecologic oncology if there isn't someone in the region. Kathleen, the next question is from uh, Lucine Sevignan, uh, and she asked about age cutoff. Um, do you think there should be an age cutoff with regards to inclusion of patients with this conservative management? So um, I think that it's all about desire for future fertility, but then also probability of future fertility. Um, so obviously for simple hysterectomy, there's no age cutoff. Um, for fertility preservation and doing a cone and nodes, um, I think what's important if possible is to have an evaluation with, with someone who specializes in um, reproductive endocrinology and infertility um, to have a discussion with the patient of, about what's realistic about becoming pregnant in the future. That field is changing so fast and I am in no way an expert um, on it despite being trained as an OBGYN. Um, so at MD Anderson, we're very fortunate because we have an oncofertility group to help um, discuss with us and with the patient the, the, how realistic it is to become pregnant in the future. Now with you know, all the, the technologies, um, you know, it's possible obviously to get pregnant very late in life. And, and I, so I don't think that age um, in itself should be a cutoff. 
Well, Kathleen, I know that we uh, obviously so, so, so grateful for you uh, addressing all of these questions. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. We have one last question from Natalia Rodriguez. I think it's very fitting because it kind of gives like the, the, the global uh, perspective on, on how we should move forward. So uh, Natalia, you want to uh, go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Dr. Esmeler, for the nice presentation. So my question is about uh, counseling. So how have these findings changed uh, how you counsel your patients now? Uh, that's a terrific uh, question to end. So um, what we actually decided as a, as a group at MD Anderson is um, that we now have these prospective data. So for women in one of the two first groups, so either a cone um, who want fertility or a cone who meet all the criteria who don't want fertility that we could manage them conservatively with lymph node assessment or no desire for fertility, a simple hysterectomy and lymph node assessment. Um, telling them about this study, that it's one study, um, it has not been replicated um, yet, um, but that it's an option for them. Um, I don't think we have enough data based on this to change uh, NCCN guidelines or other um, international guidelines, but it's very exciting that we have these two other studies coming um, that may be able to, um, you know, we'll provide additional data and, and if, if confirmed, then we could change the guidelines. If not confirmed, then we really need to go back to the drawing board and think about is this safe and in which groups, a group of women, um, is it safe? Um, so the bottom line is we are, um, I have not seen a patient since this was published who meet the criteria, but if they meet the criteria, then I would offer them um, conservative uh, surgery, um, letting them know that this is you know, very, a very limited amount of data, but good prospective data. Okay. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much. Congratulations once again. Uh, you should be extremely proud. We're all extremely proud of you and the work you've done and, uh, and the, the, the network that you created in the collaboration for, for this study. We want to, you know, obviously thank all of those who participated in the study, all the patients who took part in the study. Uh, for today's session, we want to thank all of you who joined us for asking so, so many really fantastic questions. Uh, the Journal Club recording is going to be available in the uh, website for the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer. And uh, again, we really look forward to uh, you joining us for the next Journal Club in, in November. Thank you for all the fellows and thanks to the IGCS for hosting this Journal Club. Uh, really a, a fantastic job. Thank you all so much. Pedro, can I just mention before we leave, I would like to take a screenshot of all the participants. So if you want <laughs> to be on the screenshot, please turn your camera on and I will try and take a screenshot. You, you, you're taking on Nicola's job now. <laughs> it's the Italians, you see. <laughs> That's right. I was going to say that, actually. Thank Hi, you, Sarah. You see, Thank you. I mean, <laughs> you see, Nicola, I gave you credit. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So everybody so smile and say concert. Sara, Sara, please yeah. put, put, put the, mosaic, the mosaic view. Yes, <laughs> I've put the mosaic view. I've got three pages, Renee. So <laughs> good. <laughs> Excellent. Right. One, thank, two. Thank you, Sarah. Three. Great. One more time. Getting through all of them. <laughs> One, two, three. Perfect. Oh, I love the team there. And I love one the last feedback, time. Uh, the clicking feedback. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, and three. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.